They're all here? Yes, sir. Well, let the record reflect the defendant's present with his attorney as well as counsel for the state. Uh, does either the state or the defense have anything we need to address before we bring in the jury? No, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Have you had sufficient time to review the documents that you wanted to look at? I have, Your Honor. Thank you. Very well. All right. If you'll bring them in, please. All right. Very well. I see all members of the jury are present. We're ready to proceed. Um, you may uh, resume with your examination. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, Agent Hill. Good afternoon. So on the scene at uh, Woodcrest and Meadowbrook. That, that's is that's an intersection is where the crime scene tape was when you arrived. Yes, sir. It's a T intersection. Okay. Within that intersection, um, is is that where you found? Did you actually retrieve the five shell casings that were offered into evidence? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Uh, within that, did you have an opportunity to? Uh, photograph the scene yes sir uh, I did. out there and um, place placards at the scene yes sir where you found the evidence and take yes, pictures of that um, and other than the I believe you said other than the five shell casings you documented finding um, I think uh, one or two pieces of plastic yes sir two as well as a uh, cigar? Yes, sir. Un uh, unwrapped uh, black and mild cream cigar. And also, did you notice an area of blood? Yes, sir, I did. Uh, was there one spot or two spots, or do you recall? Uh, the spot I, I noticed was one spot. Um, it was actually on Meadowbrook, just south of the intersection right at the edge of the intersection and that was a like an area where blood had had pulled it was a small but yes sir how, about how large a spot uh you maybe a couple inches and and do you recall in relation to that spot where you found the shell casings um three of them i found actually in the middle of the uh intersection which was probably 15 feet away, um, and then there was a damaged shell casing, which when I say damaged, it just kind of got flattened. Um, that was found probably within a few feet of the blood spot. And then a uh, fifth shell casing was found on the shoulder of the road, uh, kind of about the same position, but just on the shoulder of the road to the intersection. So it's kind of like right on the very edge of the intersection. About the same position as the blood spot? Yes. Um, you look at a T intersection and you know, you got three uh, corners of the intersection. The blood spot was kind of like right on the edge of the intersection. And then the shell casing was on the shoulder. Pretty much the same positioning on that street, but just on the shoulder of the road. So in relation 
to what you, you described, there were three shell casings in the middle of the intersection. Yes, sir. And they, um, and they were pretty close together? Yes, sir. Probably within a couple of feet of each other. And then um, some, I think you said 15 feet or so? Uh, yes, sir. Probably, roughly. To the blood spot? Um, well, the three shell casings were kind of in the center of the intersection. Um, the blood spot was about 15 feet away from that center um, on the south side of that intersection. And then the damaged shell casing was probably within a couple of feet of that right kind of on that side of the intersection. And then the fifth shell casing was on the shoulder road probably no more than 10 or 15 feet from the blood spot. And those, the, the one that was uh, damaged that was within a couple feet of the blood spot, and w in relation to the other three, was it um, about the same distance as the blood spot from the other three? Or? Roughly, about, somewhere about 15 feet. And then the one that you described that was on the shoulder? Was probably about another 10 feet from that one. And, and that was further from the three or closer to the three? Uh, probably further. Okay, so maybe 25 feet from, roughly from the other three shell casings? Roughly, yes, sir. Did you happen to me take measurements that night? Of any, I did not. Of the location of these items? Thank you. That's all the questions I have, Your Honor. Can you redirect? Yes, sir. Since we're asking about the location of the approach, Your Honor. Yes, sir, you may. Let me hand you back um, which what was introduced as State Exhibit 78 through 82. Um, do you recognize the, as those casings that we dealt with just a little while ago while you were on the stand? <coughs> yes, sir. Okay. And using our exhibit numbers now, um, let's specifically make sure we're clear about um, where they were all found. So. If three are basically together in the intersection, which three are those? Which which numbers? State exhibit 78, 79, and 80. Okay. So 79 through 78, I'm sorry. 78 through 80. Together in the intersection. And how about um, state exhibit 81? Where was that found? Uh, 81 was the damage shell casing that was located within a couple of feet of the blood spot on the south end of the intersection. And how about State Exhibit 82? Um, 82 is the shell casing that was found on the um, shoulder of Meadowbrook on the west side. Okay. Thank you. That's all I have here. Anything else for this witness, Mr. Cutler? No, Your Honor. Thank you, sir. You may step down. You just want to return those. Good afternoon, sir. Would you please tell this jury who you are and what you currently do for a living? I am Christopher Adam Tanner. I'm a special agent with the North Carolina State Bureau of Investigation. I'm currently assigned as a site safety officer within the clandestine drug lab program. 
what do you do as, as in, in that section of, of the SBI um, operations division? Well, as part of is is the job of a site safety officer has many facets to it. Uh, primarily, it's safety. Um, I am the agent responsible for aiding in the investigation of illegal drug labs. Uh, generally, around here, it's methamphetamine labs. Assist in the investigation. Also, oversee the processing of the crime scene, the taking of samples for submission to the crime laboratory, the mitigation of the hazardous materials present, and the overpacking and transport away of those materials for their ultimate disposal. Back in um, certainly the beginning of 2013, but basically through that year, through all of 2013, was that your um, uh, assignment within the uh, State Bureau of, of Investigation? Uh, it was not. I it took that position in October of 2013. Okay. Um, prior to October then of 2013, what were you doing? I was a senior farm and tool mark examiner in the North Carolina State Crime Laboratory in Raleigh. And how long did you do that? I started in the firearms unit in uh, May of 99 as a technician. I was promoted to examiner in August of 2001 and performed those duties until October of 2013. And what kind of training or education do you have which qualifies you to be um, a firearm and tool market examiner for the um, SBI or, or for the crime lab, I should say? Well, while I do have a bachelor's degree, the training that I received in the field of firearm and tool market identification was what I received during the course of my employment. I completed a structured and tested training program that can last about two years, and it covers a broad range of topics from the identification of ammunition and ammunition components the identification of firearms as to make, model, and country of origin, the microscopic examination of fired bullets, cartridge cases, and shot shells to determine if they were or were not fired by a particular firearm, gunshot residue testing for the purposes of distance determination, serial number restorations, gun function testing, crime scene reconstruction, and since completing training, you continue to add to that training by attending classes, seminars, and armors courses. How long um, in your duties there were you actually um, uh, classified as a either senior examiner or supervising uh, now? Um, the senior examiner is what they term a forensic scientist three, and I am honestly unsure how long I held that position. Was, was it over a couple of years? Oh, yes, way more than two years. Okay. Um, and um, have you had the occasion to, to come to court uh, to testify as an expert in this field of, of firearms examination identification before? Yes. Do you have any idea how many times you've done that? Approximately 61 times in state and federal court. Um, and um, as a firearms examiner, um, um, have you had the occasion um, when you work there in the laboratory to receive items of evidence to include ballistics type evidence of, of casings and projectiles? Um, to try and compare them with a weapon that it may have fired that um, that may have fired that projectile. Yes. Do you have an idea how many times you you conducted that kind of analysis? Hundreds. Okay. Um, Thanks. So you, um, uh, state would ask that he be allowed to, to testify as an expert in this field of firearms examination and identification. Mr. Cutler, do you want to take on voir dire or, or object to his being tendered as an expert? No, Your Honor. Um, members of the jury, in my discretion, I'm going to allow this witness to testify in the form of an opinion in the field of firearms uh, an examination and uh, analysis. And um, ultimately, it's you, the members of the jury, that will determine what weight and credibility you give to each and every witness, whether it's a, uh, someone who's offered as an expert or uh, the lay witnesses. Um, so, as I say, in my discretion, he will be allowed to testify in the form of an opinion. Uh, Mr. Sachs, you may proceed. Um, Agent Tanner, um, during your um, work with the crime lab here in, in North Carolina, did you have the occasion to receive some firearms evidence pertaining to a, a homicide that occurred at 708 Colonial Drive um, here in Wake County back in January of 2013? Yes. And what was the purpose of you receiving um, those either firearms or, or um, uh, ballistics types of evidence? The, the purpose would be the same as any firearms case, would be to take the items given, whether they be fired items of evidence, cartridge cases, or projectiles, and the firearms submitted to determine, one, did the firearms function correctly, and were or were not those items fired from those given firearms. And did you do that in this particular case? Yes. 
for how many different firearms? I believe I received a grand total of... Five, uh, four firearms and a pistol barrel. Uh, before we get into the, the actual analysis in this particular case, would you explain to this jury what you're looking for when you're trying to determine whether a either fired <laughs> projectile or casing is fired from a particular firearm? Well, we look for two things. Uh, one is class characteristics, and that's the, the first item that you look for. Class characteristics are, are technically those measurable or discernible features of a specimen that indicate a restricted group that it belongs to. Um, it, it's no different than, than automobiles. You know, if Ford is going to sit down to make a car, they're going to determine how many doors that car is going to have. It's going to be two doors or four doors. What color paint are we going to use? You know, what kind of interior is that vehicle going to have? Those are class characteristics in that they were determined prior to that automobile ever being made. Firearms have class characteristics. When a manufacturer sits down to make an arm, they first get to decide, is it going to be a long gun or a handgun? What caliber is it going to be? If we get more specific into the rifling of the arm, which are those longitudinal grooves that run the length of the bore and spiral around its interior, you know, they get to determine the number of lands and grooves and their direction of twist and their relative width. These are all class characteristics that were decided long before that weapon was ever produced. So you can look at items fired from a firearm and you can look and determine its caliber. You can measure its rifling characteristics and then you compare those to the weapons that you were submitted. Because if the class characteristics do not agree then that bullet or that cartridge case could have never been fired in that weapon. And there's no need to compare further. In the event that the class characteristics all agree, you go to the next step, which is a microscopic comparison using a comparison microscope, which simply allows you to view two objects side by side in the same plane but magnified. And then you look for the next thing that we look for as examiners, and those are individual characteristics. Individual characteristics arise secondary from the manufacturing process. They're random imperfections and irregularities that are formed during the manufacturing process itself as the, as the tools are being machined. These in individual characteristics can then be changed over time through use, abuse, wear, and it's these random imperfections and irregularities on the tool surface. And a, and a firearm is nothing more than a tool. It's an assortment of tools brought together to accomplish the goal of discharging a cartridge. Those imperfections and irregularities will then impart themselves onto the softer metal of the bullets and cartridge cases. And then as an examiner, you can look at those resulting marks along with test specimens, controls that you generate with the firearm itself to look for those individual characteristics to be present. Is that the type of analysis that you did with respect to the evidence that you, you received in this particular case? Yes. Okay. Um, first of all, may I approach your honor? Yes, sir, you may. <clears throat> Well, let me show you what's been previously marked by identification here as State's Exhibit number four. Do you see the red stick with the four on it? I do. Um, first of all, ask if you can recognize and tell us what that is. I do recognize the item. How so? Well, the item bears my markings in addition to a bunch of other markings. It bears the my initials, the laboratory case number, the item that number that it was given to it when it came into the laboratory the item number that I assigned it, uh, the dates I rece received the package, the date I opened it, and the date that I sealed this package back. Okay. Um, and as you look um, at that box um, um, with all those markings on it, um, does it appear to contain one of the firearms that you received in into evidence in this particular case to analyze? It does. And that box is now currently um, open, correct? It's not in a sealed condition right now, is it? That's correct. It's open. That's fine. Feel free to open it and please look at the, at the firearm in it. Um, can you recognize the firearm itself? I do. 
How so? Well, I can recognize it because underneath the trigger guard, engraved into the metal itself is, is the item number that I gave it, in addition to my initials and then my laboratory case number. And those same markings are on the safety bands that I placed around the charging handle. Okay. T tell the jury, because we had some information earlier about there was some extra twist ties or um, something in the chamber there that wasn't there originally. Um, what, did you, what did you do um, to these weapons once you finished working with them? Well, when I finished working them, I wanted it to be readily apparent to the next officer of the court that were to open this package that this firearm is unloaded. So I try to put it in a condition to where it's going to be readily apparent that, that it's safe. And one of the way to do that is to lock this breech open because if you hold the bolt back, well, then it's not going to be able to fire. So I threaded safety ties through the magazine well and out the side of the receiver through the ejection port and kind of uh, zip tied that charging handle back. Okay. So was that something that you did to this weapon? Oh, yeah, I did that. And the safety ties bear my initials. Okay. All right. Um, since you had that item up and it's already been introduced into evidence, can you tell us what that weapon is that's marked State's Exhibit number four? What is that? State's Exhibit number four is a Century Arms caliber 7.62 by 39 millimeter semi-automatic rifle. Serial number KMS05649. It's a model AKMS. Is that a weapon that um, we might commonly um, be, be known as an AK-47? Um, that, that's kind of a... The, the title assault weapon is kind of up to debate. It depends on one's definition. But so, yes, it could be construed as that. Okay. Um, and... Um, when you received this, this particular weapon into your laboratory for, for analysis, did you inspect it to see how, um, if and how it functioned? I did. Does it function properly? In regards to the K3 rifle, I do have that it functions properly. Okay. Um, now, also, when you receive that particular item, um, um, how do you actually go about then to determine whether that weapon would have fired some either casings or projectiles that were recovered from a crime scene? Well, you, once you examine the, or, the item and, and make sure that it is safe to fire, like you don't see broken or missing components, there's not a big crack down the side of the barrel, you know, it's not warped or twisted or anything that would make it unsafe to fire, um, we actually take it down and discharge it to get samples. Um, items that I know were fired from this gun because I myself fired them. Are those located in that box that Smart State has been before? They are. They're taped in a um, in an envelope and in a plastic bag and taped to the inner lid of the box. I may approach your own. You may. Bag tape there, State Exhibit Number 4A. Do you see that sticker on the 4A there? Yes, sir. So what is State Exhibit 4A? State Exhibit 4A are the three test fires that I produced. It's the resulting fired cartridge cases and the resulting fired bullets. And um, these are some of the let me hand you over here what's been previously introduced as state exhibits 18 through 24. Do you recognize what those are? I do. What are those? They are fired projectiles. Okay. And did you receive um, those items as potential items of evidence in this particular case? I did. Okay. Can I approach again, Your Honor? You may. Let me hand you one other group. It's Mark State Exhibits 25. Through 29. Do you recognize those?
I do. What are those? These are more fired projectile and projectile fragments. As part of your analysis um, in this particular case, um, did you compare the projectiles that you test fired from State Exhibit Number Four and located in State Exhibit Four A now um, to compare them to some of these items um, marked State Exhibits Eighteen through what is that Twenty Nine? Yes, through Twenty Nine. Yes, I received them for comparison. Okay. Um, what did you find when you did that comparison? Are you referring to them all this time? Yes, sir. Well, I determined that with stakes, respect, I'm sorry, with respect to this weapon, stakes exhibit number four. Oh, these items were not fired from stakes exhibit number four. That's what I was asking. Um, and how were you able to determine that? Well, class characteristics. Um, the majority of the items here that are not fragments, that are intact bullets that have clearly discernible lands and grooves, they have four lands and grooves with a right-hand direction of twist, wherein stakes exhibit number four has six lands and grooves with a right-hand direction of twist. So they, they can never have been fired in that weapon. And those that are just fragments um, have lands and grooves that are markedly different, um, enough so that it allows for an elimination as to stakes exhibit number four having been the source. Yes, sir. Now, with mark identification as state exhibit number five, do you see that red sticker with the five on the front of that? I do. What is that? State exhibit number five is a Mad Eye caliber 7.62 by 39 millimeter semi automatic rifle, serial number CM07037, and it's a model MISR 10. Okay. And have you seen that weapon before? I have. How do you know? Well, the box bears my markings, um, the same as Stakes Exhibit Number Four does. Also, the firearm itself is engraved under the bottom of the trigger guard with the item number that I gave this, which in this case is K-1, my initials, and my laboratory number. Okay. And again, just like we did with Stakes Exhibit Number Four, can you tell us um, about this weapon, um, how it appears, and, and what you found just from an initial examination of the, of the weapon itself? From the initial examination, um, I noted that the, the, the wood had been painted a, a pink shade, but that it has either was painted very um, lightly or was well worn. Uh, in addition, it had some damage to it. One of the upper guards is, is broken. Some of the wood is broken away. In addition, the majority of, of these arms were imported the MISR-10 were imported to take single stack limited capacity magazines, five to 10 rounds. However, this one will accept and function with higher capacity stagger column magazines. I think inside that box you'll find two magazines marked states if it's 5B and 5C, is that correct? That is correct. Um, do those magazines fit this weapon that's, that's marked states if it's number five? They, they will fit and they will function with it. And when you actually test fired this weapon, did you use those magazines? I, I tested them both into the firearm. Okay. Um, we also have some photographs where those two magazines were actually taped together. Um, um, does that have any effect on the, the functionality of either the weapon or, or the magazines as it's used if, if, you know, if, if, there, if an extra magazine is taped to one? Um, I don't have indications in my notes they were taped together when I received them. Right. Um, so I don't know the user's intent. As long as they weren't taped far enough together, you know, even, you know, they need to be offset or else you won't be able to get one into the, to the magazine well. Um, sometimes people will use couplers to actually 
bind magazines together and I believe their intent is to just aid in reloading. And but I, I would have no idea in this case while that was done. Right. And I believe the couplers you're talking about, you actually saw in the magazines for state exhibit number four, correct? Correct. The, um, uh, again, at, um, were you able to test fire this particular, particular weapon that's marked State Exhibit number 5? Yes. Um, does it function properly? It does. Um, after getting some um, um, projectiles and casings from this particular weapon, were you able to compare them to the items that we have marked over there as State Exhibits 18 through 29? Yes. What did you find when you did that? <clears throat> My opinion in regards to stakes exhibit 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 24 was that the projectiles were fired from stakes exhibit um, 5. And, and how did you come to that conclusion? It's, it's a comparison of the class and individual characteristics that I discussed earlier. How about the... Um those remaining projectiles that I have there that um, are listed as state exhibits 25 through 29. My opinion in regards to state exhibit 25, 26, 28, and 29 was that there is agreement of some class characteristics and some agreement of individual characteristics between state exhibits 25, 26, 28, and 29 and test bullets fired from the K-1 rifle. However, the agreement is insufficient to identify these items as having been fired from Stakes Exhibit 5. So is that just a, a way of, of saying they may have been fired, but there's just not enough of you to say for sure? That is correct. The remaining State Exhibit number, um, item number 27, it had, my conclusion was that there is agreement of some class without agreement or disagreement of individual characteristics between Stakes Exhibit 27 which is a jacket fragment and test bullets from the K-1 rifle due to an absence, insufficiency, or a lack of reproducibility. Therefore, therefore, it cannot be determined whether or not Stakes Exhibit 27 was fired from K-1. Okay. Um, all right. Very good. help you keep from getting too confused. Let me take the projectiles back. Let me hand you what was previously introduced into evidence as six it's 33 through 61. I'll ask you to look through those for a moment so you can tell us what those are.
Mark 6, exhibits um, 33 through 61? I can. What are those? They're Ulanovisk brand um, caliber 7.62 by 39 millimeter fired cartridge cases. Okay. And did you receive um, um, all 29 of those um, uh, casings to, uh, as part of the evidence in this particular case to see if you could compare it to a weapon for identification purposes? I did. Okay. And specifically, after you received the weapon that's marked as State's Exhibit Number 5, and the test fires that are marked now as Exhibit 5A, um, were you able to make any kind of determination as to whether or not this weapon that State's Exhibit Number um, 5 fired, or the, yeah, fired the um, uh, cartridges that resulted in the casings um, that are State's Exhibits 33 through 61? I did reach an opinion. And what is that opinion? that the state's exhibit numbers, I believe 33 through 61, were fired in the state's exhibit number five rifle. Um, could you explain to the jury, you already talked about the projectiles, talking about those things. Explain to the jury for a casing, since we're talking about those now, what are you looking for on the casing to, kind of, to make that determination? Casings generally more easily discernible. I mean, for usually clearly stamped on casing, which is the back side where the primer is, and it's what we call a head stamp, where the manufacturer generally puts their name or an abbreviation for their name or a symbol that represents their name, along with the caliber designation of that cartridge. Um, in addition to that, the metals that make up the cartridge case are much softer than the parts of the firearm that they come into contact with. So during the tens of thousands of pounds of pressure generated during the firing process, those imperfections and irregularities on the surfaces of the breech face, the firing pin, the extractor, the ejector, the chamber, all those are stamped into the surface of that metal and it leaves a signature that we can go back and compare the individual characteristics from our test fires to those items suspected of having been fired from a suspect firearm. And did you do that in this particular case? Yes. And the cartridges from the test fires, are those um, some of the items that are located in, in what's now marked as State's Exhibit 5A? I'm sorry, the test fires. Are they marked in that one? Nope, I need They are not. Do I approach your honor? Yes, you may. So let me hand you now um, what's been marked by the state's ident um, for identification as State Exhibit Number 5D. Um, did that come out of this box, um, marked State Exhibit Number 5 as well? It did. And what is that? These are the test fires that I produced using State's Exhibit Number 5. And when you did the analysis that you talked about with both the projectiles um, and the casings, did you use the test fires that are located there in State Exhibit 5D to make um, that identification? I did. And when you looked at those casings that you just talked about, um, um, are those the casings that you use in 5D to compare with the um, casings from the scene that were in 33, say it's 33 through 61? Yeah, these test fires are the ones that I use for comparison. Okay. Um, Your Honor, I move then to introduce State Exhibit 5D into evidence. Any objections? No, Your Honor. It's admitted. While we're there, Your Honor, I'll also move to introduce State Exhibit 4A, which is with the test fires from the other uh, weapon and the evidence as Any well. Any objection? No, Your Honor. They're admitted as well. Um, again, all, on this weapon, you were talking earlier how um, there's a different magazine that is normally associated with, with this particular weapon. Is that right? That is correct. Where is it that, that you're showing where it's either been um, modified or changed some way to accept um, a different kind of magazine? That area is right here, which is called the magazine well, which 
for the models of this farm that were imported to accept limited capacity magazines, the magazine well opening is narrower because the the ten round magazine is is a single column, which means the cartridges are stacked one on top of another. Therefore, the magazine itself isn't as wide as the staggered column magazines. Looking and at States Exhibits 5B and 5C, which are the magazines um, with it, are those um, stacked or staggered magazines? They're staggered. Okay. Which and just means the cartridges are all set from one another to increase the capacity of the magazine. Okay. Um, and so, how, how do I mean? How would one go about trying to do that? Trying to, to modify that if, if if the staggered magazine doesn't fit in there? How would you change that to to make them fit? Well, one step in the process is to grind down the opening to the magazine well, therefore enlarging it. And is that what has appeared to have been, happened in this particular weapon? Well, the, the inner surface of the magazine well appear, appears ground and it's uneven. Before I bring something new, let me take some of this away so that we don't get confused. been now uh, introduced into evidence in state exhibit number six. You see the red sticker with the six on there. Did you see that? I'm sorry. I did, sir. Okay. What is that? Stakes exhibit number six. Is a Haskell caliber 45 auto semi-automatic pistol, serial number of which has been obliterated. It's a model JS45. And is that one of the weapons that you also received in your lab to analyze in this particular case? Yes. And um, first of all, like we did with the other two weapons, can you tell us um, some of the characteristics or some of the function capabilities of this particular weapon? It's, it's a semi-automatic pistol that I cannot remove from the box due to the safety tie. Um, um, if there are some scissors, I think, up there on the stand with you. Feel free to use those. Do you have any question in particular about... Oh, I'm sorry. Well, first of all, does it function properly? Yes. Okay. And how about the difference? You've shown us two of these um, 7.62 rifles and, and how they work. How would that differ, if any, from the way that this uh, or, or any other handgun um, would, would function? Well, for, for one, this is, this is a handgun as opposed to a, a, a rifle. It shoots a, a much smaller caliber cartridge. Uh, it's a semi-automatic pistol, which means it'll discharge one round with each squeeze of the trigger. It is a blowback-operated firearm. What do you mean by that? Well, there's generally two ways to make a, a semi-automatic handgun. There's two basic mechanisms we see. The simplest and usually the cheapest one to make is a blowback-operated system, as opposed to the more technically advanced recoil-operated semi-automatic pistols. Um, in this particular weapon, um, did you um, receive it to try and determine whether or not some of the um, other ballistic evidence from these scenes match this particular weapon? Yes. And did you do that analysis? I did. Okay. Uh, first of all, if I may approach, John. Yes, sir, you may. Have you checked all so that it actually matches? First of all, let me hand you what's marked by identification. 
as they said it's 30 through 32. Can you tell us what those are? They are two 45 caliber fired copper jacketed bullets and one bullet jacket fragment. And um, did you conduct any um, test fires um, from the weapon there, the um, Haskell 45 caliber handgun that's uh, before you as state exhibit number six? I did. And are those test fires in that, um, in that box with that weapon? They are. I may approach your honor. <clears throat> You may. All right, sir, let me hand you now with Mark that state exhibit number 6A. Are those those test fires that you made from that particular weapon? They are. Um, and when you compared those test fires in state exhibit 6A, uh, to the items in state exhibits um, 30 through 32, uh, what did you find? That these items were not fired from state exhibit number six. And yet, let me change that sticker real quick. I think we have a 6A already. That's 6B. Is that still the bag with your test fires in it? It is. And again, just so the record's clear, when you compare those test fires that are in State Exhibit 6B um, with uh, those projectiles in State Exhibit 30 through 32, what did you find? That they were not fired from the State Exhibit number 6 pistol. Okay. Let's go with the casings then, states that it's 64 through 74. Do you recognize those? I do recognize them. What are those? They're caliber, they're CBC brand or MagTech caliber 45 auto fired cartridge cases. And did you notice anything distinctive about each of these um, cartridge cases? The head stamps were damaged. How so? They were ground or scratched to varying degrees. Okay. Um, could you read either the manufacturer's name or caliber on the back of any of those um, head stamps on any of those cases? There were some that had that had it partially visible, but I was still able to determine the manufacturer because CBC sometimes uses a primer stamp, which is a mark, a symbol that they put on to the primer itself as opposed to the case head or in addition to the marks they put on the case head. And it appears to be a V with a flat bottom or what I call a, a flat top pyramid. And did you see that mark in all these fire casings? Yes. Was that almost kind of like a class characteristics that you were talking about before? Well, it's indicative of that manufacturer. Um, and um, <clears throat> as you looked at um, the casings that you had fired from this weapon um, in State Exhibit 6B, um, were you able to compare them to the casings that are um, there in State Exhibit 64 through 74? Could you repeat that? Sure. Did you compare your test fires that you made from this weapon, which are now in State Exhibit 6B, to those casings that are um, in State Exhibit 64 to 74 to determine whether or not this weapon fired those casings? I didn't need to because I compared these items to a different State's Exhibit number and found that they were in identification to that other State's Exhibit pistol. Okay. okay. May I approach your honor? You may. Thank <clears throat> you. 
Let me hand you now with Smart Identification as they did at 78, 79, and 80. As you look at those. You recognize those? I do. Um, what are those? They are CBC or MagTech brand caliber 45 auto fired cartridge cases. Are these um, some of the casings from the other case that you were just talking about? Yes. Um, explain to the jury what, what happened when you received these items. I received the, I generated a total of six case reports, three from two separate file numbers, and I received these in, in a different laboratory case number which was R2013-00595. And when I received these items, I compared them to the fired items and to the handguns that I received in the original laboratory case number, which was 00594, and made comparisons. And what did you find? I found that these items... And we'll talk about these items. Which items are you talking about? States Exhibit 78. 79 and 80 that stakes exhibit 78 79 and 80 were fired in the six exhibit uh, K6 pistol, the Haskell 45 auto. And that's what I was going to ask. So we don't get start getting really confused with all the numbers. What brand name was that gun that, that we're talking about here? It's a Haskell. Okay. Um, do I move to introduce six exhibit 6B into evidence at this time? Any objections, Mr. Cutler? No, you are. I'll receive them. Yes, sir, you may. And you would spend now part, um, in evidence at six, number seven, ask you to review that and see if you can tell us what that is. States exhibit number seven is a high point firearms, caliber 45 auto, semi-automatic pistol, model JHP. And um, were you able to determine whether or not that um, um, handgun functioned properly? I did. Okay. And were you able to con um, conduct an analysis by making some test fires from that weapon to compare with some other ballistic evidence received in this particular case? Yes. And are those test fires located inside of that box mark six in number seven? They are. Do they already have a red sticker on them? They do not. Make that. Okay. Those, that bag of the test fires now is State Exhibit 7B. Um, did you have the occasion to compare those items in State Exhibit 7B with some of the other items um, then that was uh, submitted to you in this particular case? Yes. Let's look specifically now at what I handed you and you should still have up there as State Exhibits 30 through 32, which are those projectiles that you talked about earlier. Do you, do you have those? Yes. Specifically with respect to your test fires from State Exhibit Number 7 that are located in State Exhibit 7B, 
looking at those uh, five projectiles in State Exhibits 30 through 32, did you reach any conclusion? I did. And what was that? The State's Exhibits 30, 31, and 32 were fired from State's Exhibit 7, the high point the high pistol. Point. Okay. Let's now go to the casings, which are to your right, I think, still in State's Exhibit 64 through 74. I'm going to ask the same thing. Looking at the test fires you made um, from that hash, from the high point gun now, which are located in State Exhibit 7B, did you compare them to those casings which are in State Exhibit 64 to 74? I did. And after doing so, what did you find? I found that State Exhibits 64, 65. 66, 67, 68, 69, 70, 71, 72, 73, and 74 were fired in the stakes exhibit uh, 7 pistol, the high point. Your Honor, I do introduce that stakes exhibit 7B into evidence. Any objections? No, Your Honor. It's received. Agent Tanner, at the, at the end of uh, of, of all of this, um, what what's the the bottom line result um, for, from all your work that that you potentially did in this case with respect to, to these weapons? For instance, the high point weapon. What did the high point weapon fire? The high point weapon, stakes exhibit number seven, fired these cartridge cases, and in my opinion, fired these two bullets and bullet fragments that are caliber forty five. Okay, and that the Haskell handgun. Um, um, what did you match that to? Three fired casings from the separate shooting incident, the 00595 lab number. And then with respect to the um, um, rifle, the um, Mad-Eye, I think you call it, assault rifle, um, again, what was your conclusion with respect to what may have been fired or was fired from, from that particular weapon? That the 762 by 39 millimeter fired cartridge cases were fired in that mad eye rifle. Is that all the cartridge case the rifle cartridge cases that were submitted to you? All the fired cartridge cases. Yes, 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 sir. I believe so, yes. Okay. All right. And um, I believe earlier you had matched up um, several projectiles to that rifle as well, is that correct? That is correct. At the end of, of all of that work, did you prepare some reports to, to document um, and record your findings in this particular case? I did. You may approach, Ron. You may. What's been marked by identification as state exhibits 84, 85, and 86? 86. I ask you to look at those for a moment. See if you can tell us what those are. I can. What are those? They're three of the six reports that I prepared in regards to these two separate cases. Now, uh, these relate to um, laboratory case number R2013-00594, which is listed as being a homicide. So when you say three out of six report, I believe you said you prepared basically a double report for each finding because of these cases being related. Is that right? That's correct. When someone asks for a cross comparison where you have items in one case and items in a separate case, and I make that comparison, I have to generate mirror imaged copies. So a report under this case number detailing the comparison from here to here and then a report under this case number detailing the comparison from here to here and in this case I was given three separate groups of evidence in each case so that made for a total of six reports to complete the cross comparisons. 
And just so that we're clear, even though we only have three of those reports here, is there any other report that you would have floating out there that has different information than uh, pertaining really to this case other than what's in states as if it's 84 through 86? No. Okay. Um, specifically, um, looking at states as if it's 84 then, um, uh, um, do you see your signature on the bottom of that, of that report? I do. Um, and... Does the State Exhibit 84 um, document your findings with respect to some of the ballistics um, uh, comparisons you did, particularly with the result of the projectiles that were sent to you? It does. Okay. At the time that you completed um, or worked on the analysis that's contained in State Exhibit 84, did you have the high point weapon with, um, to analyze? I did not. So in State Exhibit 84, did you document all of your findings with respect to the other three weapons, that being the two rifles and the Haskell 45? I did. Um, and in State Exhibit 85, um, at that time, were you then given the high point 45 um, weapon to analyze? Yes. And did you document then in State Exhibit 85 your findings with respect to that particular weapon? In regards to the projectiles. Just the projectiles. Just the projectiles at the time. States Exhibit 85 was published. I had not the fired cartridge cases to compare. Right. Yeah. Um, okay. And then finally, in, in 86, because that's a good segue then into that, in 86, is that basically documenting your findings for all of these weapons with respect to the casings um, that were found in these particular scenes? That is correct. All right. And um, as you've testified here, did you document those findings um, in those reports marked State Exhibits 84, um, 85, and 86? I did. And are those true and accurate copies of your report regarding your findings in this particular case? They are. Um, Your Honor, I move then to introduce State Exhibits 84, 85, and 86 into evidence. Any objections, Mr. Collar? No, Your Honor. There are received. I see them, please. I don't think I have anything further. Cross-examination. Afternoon. Afternoon, sir. Agent Tanner. Um, may I approach and take a look at 85 and 6? Here they are. My copies, have, I think, have the state's exhibit numbers, if that would help you.
Agent Tanner, I believe you testified um, that you were provided shell casings from uh, another case. Um, the, and I believe you said that number was 595? Yes, sir. That would be the laboratory case number. Okay. Um, if, let me just ask you this. I believe you, I don't know if you have states 78 through 82. Yes, sir. I believe you testified that seven, you examined 78, 79, and 8. You recall that you compared those shell casings. Seventy eight through eighty two and just see familiarize yourself with those, please. I don't know, do you know where those what, what what's in seventy eight and eighty through eighty two? These are CBC brand uh, caliber 45 auto fired cartridge cases. All right. Now, um, do you know where those came from? I would have to try and find the laboratory submission sheet if they even indicated on it where they originated. I believe uh, Agent Hill testified earlier today that 78 through 82 were recovered from a uh, an intersection or in the roadway area between Woodcrest Drive and Meadowbrook. Um, I, I have marked on the packages Green Pine. Green Pine okay. Drive. Um, so I understood that you examined those shell casings and compared them to the to the casings that were test fired from the 42 45 caliber weapons you had. Is that correct? That is correct. And I think, as I understood, you testified that 78, 79, and 80 um, did come from, you did determine they came from one of the, or you believe, in your opinion, that they were fired in one of those weapons? Yes, sir. In my opinion, 78, 79, and 80 were fired in the Haskell uh, Stakes Exhibit Number 6 pistol. What about, did you determine if number 81 and 82 were fired in either of the pistols that were submitted? I determined that stakes exhibit 82 and 80, 81 and 82 were fired in the stakes exhibit number 7, the high point pistol. It was. And basically, what is in state exhibit number 83? It's a caliber 45 fired copper jacketed bullet. Okay. And is that um, a piece of, of, of item, that projectile or bullet, does that come from the homicide case, your 2013 number, or the other case from 2012? It's the other case. From 2012? It's the um, laboratory case number 595. Okay. 
And um, when you compare that to the test fires from each of these um, handguns, were you able to, to make a conclusion as to whether or not either one of those um, weapons fired that projectile? Yes. What did you find? It is my opinion that stakes exhibit number 83 was fired from the K5 pistol, which I believe is the uh, high point, stakes exhibit number 7. So when I asked before, and I, my fault for not mentioning that before, but in our bottom line um, kind of summary uh, of the case, with respect to that other case, we have three casings that matched the Haskell firearm and two casings and a projectile that matched the high point? In my opinion, yes. In your opinion, yes. All right. Um, and then the... That high point weapon that was introduced at stage of number seven, is that the... the 45 caliber handgun that your opinion was matched the ballistics from the homicide scene in January 2013. Yes. Thank you. That's, that's all. Anything else, Mr. Cutler? Nothing else, Your Honor. Thank you. Any other follow up at all? Yes. All right. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, it's 5 o'clock. This is a good time for us to break for the evening. I'm going to release you until 9 30 tomorrow morning. Please keep in mind the rules. Don't talk about this matter among yourselves or allow anybody. Excuse me. To talk about it in your presence. Don't form any opinions about anything that you've heard, and don't conduct any research or investigation. We'll see you back here tomorrow morning at 9:30. I'm going to ask everyone to remain seated while the jury is excused. Let the record reflect that all members of the jury have left the courtroom. Uh, anything else for the state before we adjourn? Um, no, sir. I think we had talked earlier about the schedule, and it, it's pretty apparent to me. I, we've actually mailed today a lot of the, the forensic stuff. Um, but I have two main witnesses left, but I still believe that it will probably be Wednesday when we have the defense statement to deal with tomorrow. And we have that video that's, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk about tomorrow. But uh, we get barefoot in the stand tomorrow and then Wednesday to have our medical examiner, and, and that should be near, if not the, the end of, of the state's case, so for planning purposes, I'm trying to give as much notice as I can, but I think it'll be Wednesday. All right. I um, started looking at jury instructions, and and you have any special requests or whatever prior to we, the time we get to a charge conference, um, if you would provide those for me. I mean, it's easier for me to put things in and take them out later than it is to try to plug them back in as we go. Basically, it's easier to put everything on, on the table and then take off. Um, but I think I'll have it in the conference when we get to that point. Um, did you have anything, Mr. Cutler, that you wanted to address outside the presence of the jury? No, Your Honor. Um, very well. Then we'll be adjourned until tomorrow morning at 930. Great. Staying in court.